Hi everyone. This is intended as some coaching notes for my students of phenomenological psychology who I see are uh, grappling with the word interpretation as they're learning how to do data analysis. Um, so the context is that uh, I want to clarify for you a bit what we mean by interpretation in the context of this method uh, and the coaching that I'm giving you on how to work with this method in unpacking uh, transcripts of interviews. Okay. Um, and I'm struck in uh, by some of the comments that I've received recently that there's some confusion about the word interpretation, which is natural. It's natural that there should be confusion about uh, the word interpretation as you're learning this method because you may have heard that this is not an interpretive approach to data analysis um, and that we should uh, be on guard against interpretation. And this is true in a very specific way. Uh, and if we lose sight of the context, um, this uh, idea about uh, not being interpretive can really be misunderstood badly. Uh, in such a way that it makes it actually impossible for you to explicate uh, data um, in a spontaneous and um, discovery-oriented way. Okay, what, am I, what do I mean? Um, something you've heard me say in class is that the word interpret is not univocal um, in English, the word interpret. It means many, many different things. Uh, and what I'd like you to consider is that when we say we are abstaining from rushing into an interpretive standpoint when we're reading uh, a transcript of somebody of an interview. What I mean is we are not uh, we're setting aside a theory laden interpretive position with respect to the meanings in the person's story. In other words, we need to recognize whether we have a pet theory in mind already that might explain the person's experience, a kind of a pre-interpretation, so to speak, uh, a, a sort of a, a model. Um, and we may have gotten this from reading. Uh, it, may, it may be a model that is quite compelling and important to us, theoretically. Uh, and um, phenomenology as such does not, is not opposed to theory. Um, but in, uh, in meeting the data itself, we need to recognize our own theoretical pre presuppositions and set them aside in order to encounter uh, the other person's experience in its own terms. Okay, so uh, let me say this a little more straightforwardly. If you're already attached to a particular theory, like attachment theory, for example, which some of, some of my clinical students uh, find really useful, no problem with the meanings that you found previously in, in theory, but you have to realize that that's a framework that includes a set of assumptions and set aside that framework. Just set it to the side in order to read the data you've got in front of you. Uh, your aim is to understand what the meanings are that are already implicit in that data. Later on, at the end of a phenomenological study, you can re-engage. In fact, you should re-engage with any theories that you think are relevant. But in order to really carefully uh, be present to the other person's experience on it, in its own terms, you need to set aside, um, set aside any kind of commitments to theory that you may have. And that includes any pet theories of your own. Um, and again, that's not to dismiss any insights that you may have gained yourself in clinical work, uh, for example, but rather to view any of your insights um, uh, through your own experience or studies as just possible meanings that may or may not relate to the experience of the other person whose words you are uh, reading. Um, uh, and when you actually conduct research yourself, it won't just be their words, it'll be the experience of sitting with them uh, in which you gather that those interviews. Okay, I'm not using a lot of the, the phenomenological terminology uh, in this talk because it's intended to be a little more informal than that. But you can see that I'm 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 trying to summarize the key prax some of the key praxis ideas of phenomenological psychology as I understand it in a somewhat sloppy way. But I hope you get the point.
So, all right. Let me go back to the word interpretation because that was that was what I wanted to address with you. Um, interpretation means, as I mentioned, so, so many different things in English. So we have to get much more precise rather than uh, assuming that whatever interpret means we can't do it when we're reading data. Because if we do, if, if we take the widest possible assortment of meanings of the word interpret and forbid our, ourselves from doing what we imagine that means, then we're going to actually be incapable of working with data, period. Okay. Um, if interpret, for example, means uh, simply to understand, um, okay. And if we go back, by the way, if we were to go back to the Latin um, interpretare, if, we're gonna go, if we were to go back to the Latin roots of the word, English word interpret, we would find that one of the root meanings of the word interpret is simply to understand. So obviously, we're not saying that we cannot interpret in that sense. That would be sense. That would be crazy, right? <laughs> we would tie ourselves in knots if we were convinced that we can't uh, interpret in the sense of seeking understanding, seeking to yield understanding. Let me say even more, seeking to work with the data that we have in order to yield understanding. Okay. In that sense of interpret, we're absolutely interpretive, um, as any scientist must be. Okay. Uh, but I think that one of the key distinctions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so theory-laden interpretation is the imposition of um, a pre-existing theory, whether it's a formal theory like psychoanalysis or a pet theory like uh, your own sort of personal explanation for some kind of phenomenon. Either way, uh, those sorts of theories need to be recognized um, in a self-responsible way. That's the kind of self-responsibility that Husserl is always uh, emphasizing. Recognize the presuppositions that you have naturally, that you have in your own natural attitude in your own life. Recognize them. Don't reject them, but set them to one side. Okay. Again, in order to freshly encounter the, the narrative that we're working with. Okay, so now we've talked about, or I've talked about, um, theory-laden interpretation. And I want to make uh, another distinction uh, around the word interpret, and this is uh, indebted to Merleau-Ponty, uh, to Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception in his discussion of Husserl, again. So we're still circling around um, understanding the core ideas in, in Husserlian phenomenology. And Merleau-Ponty and the phenomenology of perception uh, makes a beautiful statement. Let me see if I can read it to you in English, of course. Um, and this is in the preface. This is within the first couple pages of the Phenomenology of Perceptions. Uh, in the notes, I'll, I'll leave you the reference to this translation. But he says that, that uh, what Husserl is after, uh, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but here's the quote, is nothing more than a making explicit of the natural concept of the world, or the life world, that Husserl, toward the end of his life, presented as the fundamental theme of phenomenology. Okay. So uh, phenomenologizing is the making explicit of the life world. And in, the, in, in our case, right, because we are studying the experiences of others, we're working with the experiences of others, so we're seeking to make explicit the meanings that are implicit in the life world uh, of the other as embodied or expressed in their narratives about a specific experience. Right? That's a complicated thought, um, and I'll, I'll try to unpack a bit of that. So making explicit, so what does explicit mean? Um, and in fact, the, the word Merleau-Ponty is using in, in French is um, Explicitation. So, uh, explicare, again going back to Latin, it means to unfold something, literally. So, we're, so, the, so the root of this word means to unfold something. Obviously, it means to unfold something in order to see it that has been previously folded, folded up, right? So, uh, explicitation is 
the unfolding, the meaningful unfolding of what's been folded up together. So this is something that uh, any of you who are clinicians or who work with people um, in, in, uh, will find, I think, in, familiar in that, any, in any kind of inquiry, we're opening up something that's it's already present, but, all, but the meanings are not evident yet. So this is what we're seeking to do in phenomenological data analysis, to unfold or to open up meanings that are already given in some way. Remember, the word data means what's given. So meanings that are already, in, in a sense, present, um, but not explicitly so. They're not unfolded. We need to unfold them from a particular attitude that we adopt as researchers. Okay, it's not an everyday attitude, it's a research attitude. It's an attitude of uh, psychological science in this case. So Merleau-Ponty, I, I mentioned I was gonna make a distinction here uh, the dis that Merleau-Ponty makes. Merleau-Ponty makes a distinction between two words in French. The first is the one I just mentioned, which is explic explicitation, explication. And he distinguishes between explicitation, to make it into clumsy English on the one hand, explicitation, and expliquer. And expliquer is to explain. So Merleau-Ponty is talking about phenomenological work as that path of making explicit meanings that are so far present but implicit, implicitly present. And that's different from expliquer. It's different from explaining the meaning. Okay, why am I dwelling on this distinction between making explicit versus explaining? The reason is because, of course, Merleau-Ponty is equating a uh, linking uh, the normal attitude of empirical science with expliquer, where, see, where we are correctly seeking an explanation for a phenomena, because we want to understand, let's say, a chemical reaction. So what we want is an explanation that's going to give us a causal series of steps whereby let's say this chemical reaction unfolded, okay, causality. That's not our interest in phenomenological, in phenomenology in general or in phenomenological psychology in particular. So uh, how is this relevant to you as you're learning to do phenomenological uh, data analysis? It's relevant in this sense when you notice yourself, if you notice yourself, slipping into uh, a natural scientific attitude in which you're trying to explain what's going on in the data, follow me, then adopting, then wake up, seek to wake up in the midst of that, recognize it, because then you are no longer in a phenomenological attitude. You have, you have sort of drifted, which is quite natural at the beginning especially, you, drop, you drifted into uh, an attitude of uh, seeking to generate an explanation of the meaning in the data or the experience that's being relayed in the person's narrative about their experience. Okay, Rather than seeking to explain what you're reading, you want to instead unfold the meanings that are already given for that person, that's the intentionality, footnote, that's the intentionality of the other. You're seeking to make explicit the meanings that are already there again, from a particular perspective, from a particular research perspective. That is, in relation to the phenomenon that's under investigation. So, um, if you are uh, seeking to make explicit uh, the psychological meanings in relation to um, an experience of healing from a life-threatening illness, let's say, it's around that phenomenon that you're seeking to make the meanings in the data more explicit, the psychological meanings in the data more explicit, insofar as they bear on that person's experience of the of healing from a life-threatening illness. Got it? Uh, why uh, that last point? Uh, why does it need to relate to the phenomenon? Because in principle, the meaning in a narrative, uh, if we were to seek to make it fully explicit, there is no such thing, I would say. The, it's inexhaustible. The, 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 the meaning in our narratives about life is potentially inexhaustible. We're adopting a specific attitude toward the narrative, which is what does it tell us about the phenomenon 
which in this case, let's say the interview question would have been, please describe in as much detail as possible an experience of your healing or recovering, I forget exactly what I said, from a life-threatening illness. So that's the phenomenon. So what we are seeking to elicit in our interview is a description, a life world, a natural attitude. Now I am bringing in some of the terminology. A natural attitude, life description uh, that, that gives us, let's say, a snapshot of the life world of the other. Okay? We're not asking them to analyze their experience. We're not asking what insights they have particularly about their experience, though the, the narrative might be very insightful. No, we're just asking, what was it like? What was that experience like for you? Okay, so I'm going to wrap up to keep this fairly focused on the theme of interpretation. But you see how, uh, to come back to our distinction, if you adopt an attitude of explanation, do you see how that's going to lead you into a theorizing? It's going to lead you straight into a theoretical or a quasi-theoretical attitude because you're going to be seeking to develop a causal explanation for why the experience is the way it is. And that's going to take you directly, then you'll no longer be in a phenomenological attitude. So we're not seeking explanation, as Merleau-Ponty points out in Phenomenology of Perception. Instead, we're sort of on the Husserlian trail, track, path, of seeking to render explicit the meanings that are already there. Okay. Um, so... Uh, this is a beginning. I hope it's uh, helpful, but I wanted to sort of circle around this word interpret. So just to summarize, if interpret means gaining understanding through making explicit what's present in the data, then you are interpreting. If interpreting means developing a theory or applying a pre-existing theory in order to explain the data, then you're absolutely not seeking to do that. Okay. Here we are. Hope this has been useful.